All right, so this is uh, chapter 23, part four. So this is the last part of this chapter that uh, we're going to go over. And um, in class a little bit, we've talked about sexual selection and, and what this basically is, is, is where uh, one of the sexes is kind of choosing the other, or one of the, the sexes has different uh, differences that the other one finds attractive and so forth. And these are due to those secondary sexual characteristics. So there's two main types of sexual selection. You have intrasexual selection and intersexual selection. And generally speaking, the males are the showier of the sex. Now with intra, this is direct competition of one sex for mates of the opposite sex. So intra is within, so like intramural, these are sports in college that you might play within the college itself versus intercollegiate would be kind of between different schools, and we'll talk about that here in a second. So the intrasexual selection, this is where, for instance, a male is patrolling a group of females, um, like the lion, for instance, and he's preventing any other male from mating. And Rams is another example and so forth. And there's also some sort of a psychological advantage that they're trying to confer towards that uh, um, you know, other male that's trying to get in to uh, mate with the females. And the reason why they have, say, like the, the mane of a lion is really big or the big horns on the ram, so stuff like that, is they're trying to discourage the uh, uh, potential competitor um, from, from a competition that could result, you know, in death. And that's, that would be something that would be bad for uh, reproduction and so forth. So what this is, this, you know, showing this is trying to do is prevent harm to him and increase his own fitness, his own chance of survival, reproduction, and things like that. Okay. So that's intrasexual selection. With intersexual selection, this is where the individual one sex is going to choose mates of the other sex. And in most cases, what happens is you've got a female that's being choosy and she's uh, um, choosing the characteristics that she desires in a male. And a good example of this would be like peacocks, where the peacock has the large train and the peahen is going to uh, make the choice. And there's a good video here that you can watch from PBS. And this will be uh, the first video, video one after part four. So take a look at this and it'll kind of go through the idea of, of uh, interse intersexual selection. Okay. Um, and what, one of the interesting things with this is, is this showiness is often a hindrance to survival. So instance the, for instance, the peacocks that have these very large trains, um, they stick out, they're not very well camouflaged, and they've got a lot of weight that they've got to carry around to avoid a predator. And what the female is doing by choosing this uh, showy male is she's choosing the one that, you know, by all accounts has the, the um, best genes for survival because aside from the fact that he's got to carry around this huge train, he's got to also be able to avoid predation. And if he's able to do that, then he must have genes that are good. And that's what the female is essentially going to be able to do. And that's what's going to allow the male to pass those genes that he has on to his offspring. Okay. Um, there's other forms of breeding. We have selective breeding, for instance, um, of domesticated types of animals, uh, cattle, horses, dogs, uh, you know, pigeons, cats, etc. And this is kind of a, an example that you'll probably find kind of humorous with the, the people that are in it and how they really get into their dogs. But this is the second video after part four. And this is the, the selective breeding of dogs. It's an HHMI video. It's not too long. So just take a look at this. This is what the first frame will look like for you. And then there's also an example involving plants. And this one is pretty interesting as well. So this is what the first one will look like. This is video three after part four. So take a look at this one. Now, as far as natural selection is concerned, it doesn't really fashion the perfect organism. It's, it's limited in many ways by historical constraints. It's got adaptations that are compromises between, you know, this and that, depending on the, the history of the organism. Um, there's chance, which we've learned, bottleneck effect and so forth, that uh, can cause problems. And then uh, selection only works on that existing variation. So... Um, the first one here, evolution is limited by historical constraints. Each species, you have to keep in mind, comes from a long line of descent, a, a, a large number of ancestral forms. And this ancestral anatomy isn't scrapped all at once for a new form. You have a slow, gradual type of change many times, especially with animals. And this explains why you don't see a, a particular example of every single species that ever lives, because sometimes these changes are so small, so minute, that you don't really notice them, along with the idea that fossilization is very, very rare. Okay. So with this uh, video here, this is the fourth and final video of, of part four, but um, it's called Great Transformations and it's a, about whale evolution. And it's a PBS video. Uh, it's about probably 12, 13 minutes long, but it's really good. The guy that's in it uh, used to be a professor at the University of Michigan. So, and, and it's pretty interesting. It's well done. And it's kind of neat to kind of look and see how he kind of pieced these things together. So 
Now, just moving on here, um, adaptations are often compromises. So you have to keep in mind what makes us better in some cases hinders us in others. So think of the peacock's tail. It has a very large train, a very large tail. It has the ability to attract a mate, but it also is baggage that's got to carry around to avoid predation. So, you know, that's the adaptation that's good and it's bad. Um, chance and natural selection often interact. We talk about chance events like bottleneck and, and so forth affecting the gene pool and the numbers of alleles within them. So when, you know, if you have a storm that blows insects or birds or something like that into a new environment, the genes that get there are founding the new population and they might not be kind of representative of that entire population. We said, of course, the, these organisms go through a bottleneck. And then the last one here, chance, uh, or excuse me, uh, selection only works on existing variation. So you can't just make new vari variations or new varieties just on demand. Uh, natural selection is going to kind of determine what's good and what's bad. And then in that process, that's what's going to kind of um, kind of edit the existing variation. You're going to weed out those that aren't being successful in lieu of the ones that are. And then if mutations can arise as the environment changes that are selected for, you can kind of shift it back. So um, again, just to keep in mind, selection only works on what's there. It can't just invent new things. Mutations can, but if they're not successful in that environment, those mutations don't get passed on. And more importantly, if those mutations aren't arising in, in gametes where they can be passed on, they're not any good anyways. Okay, so that wraps up part four. Of course, as always, if you have any questions on any of these that we've gone over, uh, please make sure you write them down and we'll talk about them when we go over the understandings in class. Okay, so we'll see you soon.